everyone. Welcome to the ICOM MPR Comms Artificial Intelligence Survival Exchange webinar series. Uh, this series actually consists of three webinars, starting with the foundations of AI, practical tools, future challenges, and ethical considerations for museum communicators. It examines how artificial intelligence is shaping the museum sector, transforming creative processes and reimagining the role of the cultural institutions. Our interdisciplinary conversation and first webinar will feature two distinguished experts in the field. First, we, we, we welcome uh, Ahmed El Gamal, Professor of Computer Science and founder of the Art and AI Lab at uh, Rutgers University. And uh, his work explores how artificial intelligence can drive artistic innovation and impact uh, museum practices, and he will guide us through the thought-provoking topic of museums at the age of artificial intelligence. Uh, joining him is Robert Stein, uh, Chief Information Officer at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Uh, with his extensive experience in museum technology and leadership, Robert, Robert will share his insights on the interplay between AI and the museum sector, addressing the critical question, who steers the ship, art and the impacts of AI. Also, I would like to mention that uh, we have like two forthcoming webinars, which they are actually on the 14th and 21st of November. All the webinars are going to last for an hour and 15 minutes, taking place on Zoom, which is like a, a global actually a platform like for online participation. Please actually share on the chat where you are from. And uh, we can start our webinars with uh, the first presentation from Ahmed El Gamal. Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me for this. Um, um, let me share my screen. All right, uh, let me start now. Um, so um, um, uh, let me start by a little bit of background. I'm a computer scientist doing AI for the last um, 30 uh, plus years, um, but I also have a, a big passion for art. And, and um, over the year, I shifted from just pure AI into the intersection between art and AI for that reason, and have been working um, uh, in exploring uh, how AI can be useful in uh, several aspects of, of uh, the art space, whether uh, art history um, um, or art making as well. And, and um, I established a lab called the Art and AI Lab at uh, Rutgers University uh, about 10 years ago, um, 12 years ago now. And over the year, we have been exploring many problems. Uh, these are just some of the things that we um, have been doing, uh, things related to um, making AI understand a little bit about art, uh, understanding what art is. Uh, uh, I'm talking about visual art in particular here, but it can expand. We have also project in music and others. Um, uh, uh, what's an, uh, an artwork? Um, uh, what's a genre of an artwork? What the style of an artwork? What's the iconography of the artwork? What's the style? How the style progress over time? Things like that. And um, 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 Years, I mean, uh, more than 10 years ago, um, we di did some research that uh, got a lot of attention in the media um, where we look at uh, artworks and try to uh, discover uh, artistic influence, influences between artists. And for me, um, that, as a computer scientist, as an AI person, that was an early signal that AI can now look at uh, artwork and do something useful. Uh, for example, here are two uh, artworks, and in, 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 you see here one by, um, uh, Norman Rockwell in the right, and one on by the French artist uh, Basile um, in the in the left, and uh, these are uh, fifty years apart and in two different continents, and no art historian have put them side by side basically because it's very hard to to imagine the relation, but the AI just brought, brought them to our attention and um, start telling us basically there are a lot of relation, a lot of similarity here in terms of composition. So you can see a big window here, a big window here, that share here, that share here the oven here, the oven here, three people here, three people here, and the stairs going up here and the tilted frame here. So striking compositional similarity that AI can catch on. And that uh, uh, 
uh, got me interested in, in this very much. I mean, AI now, 10 years ago, basically, um, started to uh, look at art and, and give us some useful uh, information that we didn't know. So we went into that. And uh, here I'm just showing um, very briefly, uh, because of the time, some examples of, of how AI can be useful. Um, and there are two ways AI can be extremely useful. Um, um, at the macro level, when you look at a hundred of thousands of artwork, um, and obviously at that scale, when you have hundreds of thousands or millions of artwork, this is beyond the human scale. A uh, human cannot really um, uh, uh, get any information out of this mass of, uh, uh, of, of data. But on the other side, at the micro level, if you look at the uh, artwork at the microscopic level, at the, at the lens level, at the stroke level, uh, AI can also be very useful because an artwork can have um, thousands of, of brush strokes, for example, and analyzing these brush strokes is beyond the human ability again. And AI can really um, give us very information, useful information that can be used for um, authentication, for example. Um, so I'll show some examples of these uh, uh, um, uh, two different uh, ways of AI, uh, how AI can be useful in, in, in the museum context. Um, in terms of research, for example, here's an example also that show that AI can look at art and, and, and tell us something that we don't know. Um, here we train AI uh, to look at artwork and identify styles, just basic styles like Renaissance, Baroque, Impressionism, things like that. And we discover something very interesting that AI by itself arranged artworks in some chronological order without giving it any information about, about time. So you see in this plot here that how AI arranged artworks uh, from Renaissance to Baroque to, to uh, 17th century, 18th century, all the way to 19th century art here. You can see basically Impressionism here and then going 20th century uh, right, right here. So basically put everything in a correct chronological order reflecting the stylistic changes without telling it anything about, uh, about art. This is a work in collaboration with art historian Marianne Mazzoni uh, from College of Arts, uh, Charleston that was, do that was done um, in 2019. For me, that's very important because it really shows us that um, uh, AI can look at uh, uh, an artwork and uh, relate them, relate artwork in a ways that we never seen before, and and can lead us to a lot of discovery that can be quantified um, mathematically. So this is a very new uh, way of looking at art history, um, uh, uh, which I think can be very useful in the future. Um, but let me go to some useful uh, use cases. Um, so. Um, AI can really help us in answering four fundamental questions. Uh, if you give, are given an artwork, uh, what is it I'm looking at? Uh, if you are not sure what is this exactly, can, AI, I can help you with that. Um, if there are similar objects in museum collections similar to this artwork, um, is it an exact match for this artwork? Is it, for example, it's a print or, or a lithograph? Is there some exact match somewhere so I can tell no information about this if I don't know? Um, and is it authentic or fake? Uh, so these are four different questions that AI really can be very helpful uh, in, in these. And this is uh, useful for museum, useful for, for um, uh, if you are in the art market, in the gallery space, in the auction houses space, even if you are art researcher, art historian researcher, um, <clears throat> even for border control. I mean, border control have a lot of, a lot of trafficking of uh, uh, art and uh, artifacts, and, and this can be very useful to this kind of uh, technology. So I start answering some of these questions and show, showing use cases of how can we uh, use AI to answer some of these. So back in 2018, we uh, did our first, uh, what we called art API, um, called art by. Basically it's, it's art AI uh, API that are designed for art. It allow, it uh, is aware of concepts like style, genre, subject matter, composition, space, light, color. So it understand what are the elements and the principle of art. And, and that can be, be useful in many cases. And um, um, here is an example. You give it an artwork like that, and automatically it recognizes this is a Baroque. Uh, this is um, a subject in mythology, uh, allegory. Uh, its best match is a Caravaggio. Uh, tell you something about the light, dark con light dark contrast, the space is shallow, the composition lines, and can give you lots of attributes and even uh, understand iconology as well. And moreover, it can um, uh, search museum collection uh, to find out similar artwork. And similar here is very uh, big word because similar can be in, in, in stylistically similar, compositionally similar. Um, uh, uh, there are many ways, dimension of similarity here that you can control. Another example here, um, 
um, of an artwork by Cezanne and again, uh, retrieving a similar artwork um, uh, by visual uh, analytics here. But this can be useful beyond that because this can be also match artworks that are taken from different viewpoints, for example, for example sculptures and, and uh, installation. It's, it can really, really match these artworks taken from different uh, viewpoints, which has a very useful application as I'm gonna show. Uh, here is an example, an artwork. We, 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 we're not sure what is this. Uh, Blog it in art by it. Uh, we couldn't find it in the museum collection that we index here, but uh, it, it identified the style, it identified the landscape. It has a best guess about the artist, which is actually correct. Um, and the best match in the collection um, is by another artist, and tell you other information. Um, but then when we search about the same artwork in another museum, uh, we searched in, in the Brenniston Museum of Art, for example, collection that we also index. Um, uh, we find the uh, exact match. We, right away we can find the exact match and that can really tell us what exactly are we looking at. Who's the artist? Um, um, uh, now this information comes from the catalog of, 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 of the museum um, and uh, uh, the medium, the year, everything. So we know now everything about this, this, uh, this work. So here's a, a use case of that. Um, that uh, was done with, in collaboration with the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. And actually, Barnes Foundation was pioneering in using AI uh, back in 2018-19 uh, time when uh, they rebuilt their website and integrated AI into the website. Um, and till now, maybe uh, Barnes Foundation is still one of the very few museums who really integrate AI in a very nice way in their website for the viewers. So if you go uh, to the Barnes Museum uh, website and look at the collection, uh, you can actually uh, search the collection visually by clicking on any artwork and specifying um, uh, whether you're looking at other artwork based on similar similarity in, in line, in light, in space, in color, in, um, or just let the AI just uh, curate the, the similar work from the collection for you. Again, this is something that might, as an expert, it might not find it valuable, um, but for a regular viewer of in the website, or regular museum goer that can be very, very useful in exploring the collection. Um, so um, here is a demo actually from, from the website. This is a screenshot from a few years ago. So you can click on any artwork like that and right away you can explore uh, other artworks in the collection that um, uh, is stylistically similar to this. Uh, so other works by Renoir here, for example, um, from the collection. And that's very important for the Barnes because in, as you know, the Barnes Foundation in particular, arrange things in the walls um, by Barnes himself uh, in a way to reflect the stylistic similarities and, and uh, elements of art. So this way um, reflects uh, that, that vision. And, and as you're gonna see, um, that can really help you explore the collection in a very uh, nonlinear way. You can move um, from one genre to another genre, from one artist to another artist, from one medium to another medium. And uh, you can see for them it works works for not only for for um, being things but um, for for other artifacts as well. So let me move forward here. Um, so as I mentioned, it works with furniture, it works with metal works, it works with uh, jewelry, it uh, was mask, was any uh, many other uh, objects. Um, and does uh, all this actually doesn't require any text annotation at all. So just use the images of the auto artwork to, to, uh, to find these, uh, 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 retrieve these similar objects. So really that can help a museum skip all the necessary uh, info, data entry information. You just have the images and the AI really can, can use that to, to, um, to do these visual searches. Uh, here's another use case um, where we use this technology uh, to look at what are the most Instagram artwork in an art fair or a museum. Lots of people go to the museum or, or art fair, take photos, uh, post on Instagram, on social media. Um, and we wanna know what's interesting to people, what's are the most Instagram artwork. Um, and that can be done easily using uh, the same technology. So here uh, we did that with different, uh, with different um, uh, uh, art fairs. Uh, it works even with with uh, an installation like that, where basically you can, people can take the different uh, the art, artwork from different viewpoints, but still uh, we can identify that all these photos are um, that are posted in Instagram are about the same artwork. Um, so uh, we started doing that in in Art Basel, Miami, 2018 and and, and 19 and and Freeze, London. Uh, so we did it with, with several uh, exhibitions uh, and, and uh, art 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 fairs. 
So we download images from, from Instagram, automatically filter out all irrelevant fil uh, selfies, and use the, the AI technology that, to really uh, match artwork together and find out what art, art, art basically the most Instagrammed uh, works. For, for example, here are some examples of artworks and, and a grouping of, of, of the photos of different people. And we published this in, in several uh, artsy uh, uh, articles over the years, basically, where basically we showed what are the most Instagram works in, 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 uh, in these exhibitions. Um, another use case here is how to visualize large collection of artworks in a museum. We know um, museums have tens and hundreds of thousands of, of artifacts and very small um, collection is in display at, at any time. And, and the museum websites um, usually just show um, very few parts of the collection, or even if it has a, the whole collection online, it's very hard to visualize a huge collection. Imagine a museum has 50,000 uh, artworks. How can you put them online? Um, um, and typically museum websites just uh, put things in a grid way, a typical grid way, which is go back to the um, 20 or 30 years old technology in terms of uh, the web development. Um, can we do better than that? Um, here uh, we, I'm showing a demo where we can we can visualize uh, basically what you are seeing here about 50,000 artworks in front of you, um, and AI automatically curate this and arrange it um, stylistically, where you can navigate the collection on a browser, on a, using VR or using AR uh, headsets uh, in a metaverse settings. You can visualize this collection as a viewer. Uh, just by navigating through um, in 3D as you see right, right away. And um, it's very fast. It can really allow you to visualize in front of you these 50,000 artworks. And you can see how things are, 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 are arranged automatically um, uh, uh, in a stylistic uh, uh, manner. Um, so I really take, take the job of us, uh, uh, which is very hard for a human to really uh, arrange this collection um, in a continuous way. I, 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 the reason I like this is that even we have the, the curation and annotation of the data, um, it's discrete. Uh, you move from one genre to another, or one artist to another, or one school to another. But here you can see the smooth transition from one uh, um, uh, style, genre, medium to the next um, in, a, in a very fluent way uh, without having to, uh, to go back or go to another page or, or, or um, uh, or search for something that you are not sure what, what where, where it is. Um, let me move forward for six time. Um, um, how much time I have? You have a few minutes. All right. So I'll, I'll briefly just go over um, um, how to find an exact match and how to a little bit about authentication because I don't want to. Uh, I don't have much time for that. Um, uh, again, if you have an artwork like that, you can find um, uh, similar things in the collection. Um, and using AI uh, computer vision in particular, you can really find out whether that's exact match or not. Uh, so here is an, uh, um, uh, an artwork that's not exact match, while if you have an exact match, um, computer vision can really um, um, find that for, for you. And uh, here it's a, uh, once, once it's an exact match, you can really uh, match them and, and find out that it's exact object in the collection. And this can be very useful in discovering for forgeries. Um, for example, um, uh, many of the uh, um, uh, fake art you found online, uh, if you go to um, auction, uh, lots of auction houses online, um, are done, uh, I think, by copying some original artwork, um, uh, especially prints and lithographs, uh, copying it by hand and selling it as original, or making a vestige by, by taking um, some feature from one artwork and another and making a new one. And this is something that can be easily debunked using AI. Um, for example, here's an, a, a case we done with eBay uh, back in 2018 when we look at um, 30 artworks from, from eBay uh, being sold for uh, relatively high prices here uh, as original artwork by Matisse or Picasso or others uh, as Bin and Ink uh, 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 work. And easily using AI, you can really um, match it to a museum collection and right away find that this is a lithograph, um, it's a famous lithograph by, by, by uh, Matisse. Um, it's very hard for them to, to, to know that because you have, uh, manually you have to go through uh, tens of catalogs until you find out if it's the exact same thing or not. And um, comparing them, right away you find that the forger here just copied that work from a book or something and trace, trace the work uh, by hand. So this is a very good uh, uh, use case of uh, 
how AI can be very helpful in recognizing what are you looking at and whether there's an exact match. And in that case, it's a fake because of an exact match to a lithograph. Um, I'll skip here. I was just want to show one video about authentication because we have a lot of work also on authentication using AI. And um, uh, these are work that back from 2017 when we use AI to authenticate artwork at the stroke level. So from a single stroke, we can really uh, find a signal that can tell whether uh, who is the artist. And we have been working on that over the years. But here is um, a, a, um, an example demo of how this works. So basically an artwork is analyzed a stroke by stroke and a green uh, a color uh, indicate that a stroke of Picasso and a red uh, um, um, uh, stroke indicate that it's not likely Picasso stroke. And this way you can really identify fake. I will stop here for the sixth time and I'll leave the rest for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we would like actually to move into like a uh, rock stain. Rob, we can't hear you. Thank you. Um, you would think after three or four years of doing this remote thing, even the IT guy would have it figured out, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel better uh, now. Thank you. Right. That was just to put everyone at ease. Um, the important part that you missed is that I said, thank you for having me <laughs> this afternoon. Um, Christiana, thank you to uh, ICOM and ICOM NPR for hosting these sessions. Um, and again, I'm I'm Rob Stein. I'm the Chief Information Officer at the National Gallery of Art, uh, where I've been here since about January of 2023, um, and joined the gallery from work in lots of other art museums uh, around the country. Um, and today I wanted to take a little bit of a different track and think some together about where AI is going um, and how we might all begin to think think about that critically and as museums, um, how we might be able to step in in some ways to help. Um, so to get started first, I think I'd just like to mention that AI has been an area that the National Gallery of Art has been investing in heav heavily um, for almost two years. Uh, this corresponds largely to the time in which AI large language models became um, more well-known. Um, I think they've been around for many years, but they really sort of popped into our attention in that uh, early 2023. Um, and we we jumped on them at that point in time as it was clear that this is a, a shift in the technology that is new. Um, and in many ways, it feels like a, a discontinuity in how we think about technology influencing the way that um, not only we work, but the way that our culture works, how humans will end up thinking about knowledge overall. Um, it feels similar to me as um, as it did when the World Wide Web was first happening in the early 1990s, or as we were all as museums trying to wrap our heads around social media and what we called Web 2.0 at that time. Um, so here at the National Gallery of Art, you know, we've really been um, also doing a lot of development work in pilot and production examples that use predominantly generative AI. And I'm, Ahmed was sharing um, some great work and brings a lot of expertise from an AI discipline that's quite a bit larger than just generative AI. Uh, I think for my talk, this is uh, a little bit more of where I'm focusing. Um, in our use cases, uh, we're working in three main areas. Uh, the first is to create AI systems that can generate visual descriptions of artworks that might help us open accessibility online for blind and low vision audiences. Um, we think that that audience number is about 20 million people here in the United States or about 8% of the population. And of course, that's only a fraction of the global audience. Um, we are doing work with uh, AI chatbots to help um, transcribe and analyze uh, tens of thousands of handwritten visitor comments and also 
text comments from um, online reviews or emails that come into the National Gallery continuously and can be hard for staff members to code and actually treat as a data set. Um, so we are creating chatbots that allow us to essentially interview a member of the, the audience through the, the transcribed version of these comments. Uh, and then the third use case is really in thinking about automated data extraction and modeling on top of um, digitized archival documents. Uh, there's a collection at the National Gallery uh, that Deborah knows well called the Index of American Design. It uh, account, amounts to about 20,000 watercolor depictions of design objects that um, was a part of a Works Progress Administration project um, to put artists to work, but also to document what an American aesthetic of design was at that time. So uh, my background um, has not always been in art museums. Uh, I'm not an art historian by training. I'm a, I'm a technologist uh, and a software developer. And my first career was um, really in high performance computing and 3D visualization. So Ahmed, I really appreciated some of what you were showing of the collection browsing work. Um, and so it's not maybe surprising that I'm a half glass, uh, glass half full kind of guy when it comes to AI. And, and I do honestly think that this is a transformational moment for us um, and is something that we should all be taking really seriously and doing our due diligence to learn about this, what I think is a seismic change. Um, but I think it's also fair to acknowledge that this technology is moving really, really quickly um, to the point where it's a, a, a blink and you miss it sort of moment. Um, and we're moving into some waters that are are fairly unknown and uncertain. Um, the technology has developed in some ways that uh, open what feels a little bit like a Pandora's box of identity and authenticity and uh, what, what agency means as a human uh, compared to uh, automated or technical agents. And so when we think about um, AI's progress just in the last two years or even the last six weeks alone um, and then try to fast forward that a little bit you know it feels that the progress is inexorable um, or inevitable <laughs> unavoidable predestined you know if you just look at the amount of money that has been invested in the development of this technology in the last two years it it in fact swamps the investment in any other kind of technology at this point in time. Um, and so it makes me think a little bit about, you know, what what happens. Um, and um, for a variety of reasons, it, it made me think about uh, this irresistible force paradox. Um, I'm not sure if that title is familiar to you all, but I think this part is, is this question of, you know, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Because um, in some ways, it feels like this development of AI is a, is a train that is rolling quite fast. Um, so it, it made me, um, it made me think uh, about a, an event that happened here um, in the United States, close to my hometown in Washington, D.C. And it was the the collapse of uh, Baltimore's Key Bridge. So this is the bridge that crosses Baltimore's Harbor. And on March 23rd at 1.30 in the morning, um, we all saw that a container ship named the Dolly collided with the Key Bridge. And you see this video of the bridge absolutely collapsing into a ruin. Um, six people were killed um, at that point in time. The Port of Baltimore was crippled for months. Um, many people's lives were disrupted. Um, and, you know, as we sort of the next morning dawned, um, this is the image we were left with. And you can sort of see that this ship, um, which I think was the size of the Empire State Building, laid on its side and piled with shipping containers um, filled with commerce and product and the livelihood of, of so many people um, that this inexorable force of, of commerce um, 
just had so much mass that stopping it, or in this case, even steering it effectively um, was too difficult. And it resulted in this somewhat unfathomable accident. And unfortunately, I, I think today, sometimes AI is, is feeling this way. Oops, let's see. Um, it's like we're piloting a big ship <laughs> at night through murky waters and sh with shoddy steering. <laughs> and, and that should be concerning to all of us. The inertia that's set up behind the development of AI right now is very much like this container ship loaded for bear and moving as fast as it can. Um, and in fact, the, the problem is a little worse because no one actually even agrees whose job it is to steer the ship. So that thus I've given away the secret of my presentation title. This is this is what we're thinking about. Um, and um, it made me recall a meeting um, that we hosted here at the National Gallery um, in the fall of 2023. And we had with us um, as a speaker, uh, a really fabulous faculty member from uh, Stanford's Institute for Human-Centered AI named Ge Wang. Um, and Ge wrote a book in 2018 called Artful Design. And I remembered this book and one of his quotes because uh, it really stood out to me. Um, and it it says, um, we find ourselves in an age of rapidly evolving technology and unyielding human discord. Increasingly, the world we inhabit is the one we make where engineers directly and indirectly shape our lives. But as our tools ever precede our understanding of their implications, and as our intelligence ever precedes our wisdom, we're faced with difficult questions. Uh, what are the values that should guide us in the consideration of not only what technology can do for us, but what should we, what what we ought to do with it? And this felt, you know, very very timely at this particular moment in history, um, and it rang so true. Um, but again, echoing to us from the past of pre-pandemic past of 2018. So it made me ask the question, you know, maybe um, maybe museums should play a part in steering this ship. Um, and if you'll tolerate me for a moment, I'm gonna unpack why I think that's the case. And what do museums know that AI and big tech could really learn from us? And the first is that we know about AI and specifically these large language models that they've read the internet, they've read it all. And they work like a giant probability machine, um, like a calculator for statistics, not math. AI feeds off the probability of all of our words. And so it could do a good job of presenting my next one because maybe it's already read my slides. Um, but what this means is that the, the winner in an AI world is not the one that is the smartest, the fastest, the best by any measure, except for being the loudest. Um, but museums, we know that those dominant stories are not the only ones that matter. They may be the loudest, they may be the most prevalent. The victor writes the his history books, um, but in museums, we try to tell more than just the simple aspect of the story. And reality, as we know, is very complex. That complexity is not currently modeled in these AI, generative AI systems. Similarly, um, today, and this could change in the future, maybe by the time we're off this call, um, but AI doesn't have a model for how knowledge changes over time. And how, um, but museums have invested decades in scholarship and we know about how knowledge advances. Um, and in fact, we are similar to the work of libraries and institutes of higher ed that knowledge and scholarship is built upon prior knowledge and scholarship. And the ability to trace the development of, of knowledge is uh, something that's important to our work, but is not you know, currently implemented in the AI systems. Uh, so an AI considers an article, an art history paper from the 1940s of equal value to an art history paper written in the 2020s, um, and that's a problem. We know that AI uses this law of averages uh, to kind of give you the answer that sounds the most right. Um, 
And but what that neglects is that even small impacts and individual actions can change the course of history. This is something that museums have built uh, almost their entire practice around um, and is a nuance that's lost in this uh, this current approach for computing. And it's something that I think that museums and especially our curatorial colleagues could play a really important role bringing to the table for the further development and advancement of AI. We know that AI is biased because it's read the internet, it inherits those biases, but it inherits the biases of an internet that only started in the 1990s and forwards. And we in museums know that our understanding of bias changes over time. So this is a photograph of Ellis Island here in the United States. When my family, who was from Ireland, immigrated to the United States, there was a lot of bias specifically directed towards Irish immigrants. That is not the case today. And I would say that today's biases aren't likely to be the case tomorrow. So if AI solves for today's biases, but doesn't consider the fact that our bias changes all the time, um, then we're just back in the same position yet again. So it leads me to say, you know, what if if we think we have this kind of value, what should we do about it? And what could museums do to help steer that ship? And the first perhaps obvious point is that you can't steer the ship if you've never been on a boat. Um, so even though AI is flawed right now, um, for those of you that are sitting on the fence, you should really get in it, get in the game and use the parts of AI that are good to do good work right now, um, but inform yourself on what the problematic aspects of AI are. As you experiment, as you work, as you build real things, if you keep an eye out for the good and the bad, you'll not only learn a lot more, but it'll let you do a better job of steering that ship when you have the opportunity to do so. I think as museums, we need to recognize the value that we already have that we're bringing to the table. I think it can feel intimidating to sit in the room with some representative from a big tech company who's trying to sell us on a product or urge us to partner with them. And so sometimes we feel like we're not, we don't have a lot of bargaining leverage in a uh, case like that, but I think it's the other way around. Um, these big tech brands are really interested in the value of your endorsement and they crave validation from trusted brands. You all represent really important trusted brands in your institution, in your nation and around the world. So when you're sitting with uh, a big tech firm or an AI company who wants you to partner with them for a pilot, consider why, what's in it for them and in fact, you're you're giving them legitimacy. And so that's worth an awful lot in this game. The other thing that's worth an awful lot is the value of your content and collections. One of the things that we know is a huge problem for the further development of AI is that it's already read all of the internet. It's already transcribed all of YouTube. In essence, we're running out of content to train AI and especially high quality content. Now, for better or worse, museums sit on a lot of high quality content that is either as yet undigitized or if digitized, then not published. This becomes a really, really, really valuable resource for the further development of AI models. And in fact, we've heard some people calling it the new oil, that this these content repositories are scarce and becoming more scarce. And that's something that I think museums have underestimated. So if we have this leverage, what should we do with it? Um, and I would urge us all to advocate for transparency in AI development. Um, is our work in museums, we really care about the nuances of reputa uh, representation, knowledge, and who has access to that knowledge. Um, that is important to us, but the way that the technologies are developing today and the amount of money that's behind there, it encourages this black box approach of proprietary development. And it's not so simple to say just because you eliminated the bias in this one set of examples, or you provided access to one group of users or tested the results and it's quote unquote good. Um, we, If it's just a black box, you don't know how they got to that end conclusion. And so I think for us, advocating for transparency and access is a really important outcome and a way to steer the ship. 
So in closing, you know, if we think hard about it, uh, we have a lot to offer. Um, museums are very intelligent about how content is communicated to our audiences. And you, especially as communication professionals, know that more than anyone else. So perhaps we can play a bigger role than we ever thought. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was a very inspiring uh, presentation. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, so like actually, it raises like many questions. So I would like to open the floor to the audiences and uh, perhaps actually ask uh, some questions based on our presentations today. I've got some questions. Yes, please. Yeah, I have actually two questions. One for Rob, which is that, uh, um, do you mean Rob, that is it possible to mediate visitor participatory through chat box that you mentioned? And overall, uh, my question is that, uh, you know, since I am so concerned about uh, community participatory or community narratives, I was thinking, uh, I know that uh, through machine vision, uh, we are able to do four things, four, four impacts of machine vision, which we could identify subject matter and uh, uh, recognize similarity and patterns, etc. But the thing is that uh, Rob uh, very well said that uh, we are uh, not here to tell the dominant story. So how likely is it that the main interpretation uh, could be conveyed through community narratives. Do you all see it uh, as something would happen in the future or not? That's it. Well, uh, thank you for your question. I, I think it's really important and one that defies an easy answer. Um, I think I could attempt to answer one part of it. Um, as it applies to AI, I think many of our museums are sitting on narrative content from our visitors. That that could be in a an interview uh, or a letter that they've written us, um, a comment on social media, and we have the ability to collect that in large volumes. Um, but we don't have the staff to make sense of those large volumes. And so what we've been building are tools where the AI can help us to code that narrative feedback. And it, you could think of it working for oral histories as well. Um, and so the AI is both one where you can ask it questions and it can tell you what it thinks with citations from the data set you gave it, or it, it might help you to use techniques similar to what Ahmed was saying, where may model some of the topics that spring out to you from, you know, 10, 20, 100,000 uh, letters that you've received. Um, so that's, that's what the way we're trying to use AI. I think the other half of your question, and I may um, invite some of my other colleagues to chime in on it as well. I do believe that it's possible to tell a nuanced story through the voices of our members of our community. I would probably advocate that AI is a poor tool to do that right now because of the way that it uh, works is trying to distill um, a lot of knowledge and content into one answer that is the most pleasing to an end user. And pleasing is not what we're really looking for. Um, in, in the area that you're sharing, but uh, I want to leave some room for my other colleagues to chime in too. Yeah, if I just add um, to this, um, as I pointed in the beginning, I mean, I, I really uh, find that the value of AI is in uh, complementing and augmenting human abilities in areas that we are not good at. As we have really have to understand our strength and our weakness as a human and and how what AI can can do for us and um as as Robert mentioned we are very good at 
understanding subtlety and, and uniqueness of things, while AI is a statistical tool that look at averages and patterns and things like that. And these are totally complementing uh, uh, abilities. So that's why AI is very good at looking at millions of things um, and get us answers. Um, but we are good at uh, the, the human scale of things and understanding uh, this uniqueness of, uh, of object and subtleties, especially in, in the humanities domain and the uh, art history domain and, and museum domain that's very fundamental. Um, uh, so combining this statistical ability of AI, the massive ability of processing data and, and uh, ask, answering question with the human uniqueness um, uh, is very fundamental to, uh, to uh, move forward at this point. Thank you. You know, this arises this question that uh, uh, usually I have a witness as a, you know, as as a museum professional, that there are some uh, misinterpretation uh, regarding some object, especially when there is an occasion, there is an occasion. Uh, for instance, I remember once a mall, one of the most famous museums have, uh, uh, it, uh, it was supposed to uh, say that the new year in uh, Arabic world uh, is a, uh, going to start and it was it has written that happy muharram with an object from iranian context which they consider muharram uh, as uh, not uh, some month that is uh you should con congratulate or something it is a mo morning actually uh month for uh iranian and uh, these type of these types of uh mistakes uh in interpretation comes from exact, exactly from the human aspects of it. So uh, how we can avoid these kind of mistakes by uh, using uh, AI or other technologies, which can uh, help us uh, to contextualize the uh, narration. Uh, that's it, it, it was uh, just, an example that I remember to thank you. Deborah, can you unmute yourself, please? Um, I'm just I'm working on um, disinformation right now, particularly Russian disinformation in terms of the situations that we're in. And so I'm I'm concerned how can museums be helpful, I suppose, to put it simply, in terms of dealing or, or with how disinformation, what is the what is the impact of disinformation? How could, you know, um, people with ev evil intent, let's say, um, mess with AI? <laughs> um, because, so I'm, I'm curious about that. Is there, how do we, can museums fight that? Can, is that a, can museums use AI to prevent, to ameliorate the role of disinformation? I open that to both of you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, I think Robert can have an insight on that. Um, but yeah. in general, I, I, I um, and that's also um, related to the previous question, uh, AI at this point is way from being perfect. It's amazing what we can do now with things like shared GDP and others, but it's, it's as an AI person myself, uh, um, I can tell you basically that it's way from perfect, perfect. I'm gonna have, have long time before AI can be really uh, good uh, and understanding factual information and in, in being in useful reasoning and things like that. So we have to live with an AI uh, or AI systems that are not not good or or not perfect, and we have to live with that and we have to deal with that. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, um, many people talk about artificial general intelligence coming and and uh, in general, I mean, um, this is a very um, um, strange concept because uh, it's very hard to define what is intelligent to, to define what's artificial general intelligence to start with. And, and every time AI advanced, uh, um, people redefine intelligence in a, a higher power. And so we're gonna be in a long, uh, in a loop of uh, advancing AI before we reach 
is the eye, we may never reach is the eye at all. But unfortunately, within this loop, a lot of harm can happen, and a lot of good things can happen as well because um, AI uh, is open uh, source mainly and can be used by anybody to do harm. Um, and we have seen that in, in a lot in social media, um, in deep fakes and others. And it can be also used uh, for good purposes. So, uh, and, and, and the debate about um, artificial intelligence that which dominated the AI community is non relevant at all to this because most of the harm and most of the benefit happens while we are talking. Um, so museum can, can definitely um, be a great help here. Um, um, and, and this actually go before even the age of AI that we live in now, now to the age of internet and, and uh, all the fake information on the internet. Uh, and uh, when Google search came around in the last 20 years, one big, big thing Google made is that basically with the way search algorithm work, it kind of filter down um, all the pages that has junk information and authority uh, 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 in terms of museum pages and things like that, and Wikipedia and things that has uh, more reliable information came at the top. So search algorithms were very good at uh, at doing that and and at helping at, at that time of of. Um, 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 uh, managing the effect of, of fake information on the internet. And now in the age of AI, the same problem happened again. In one sense, AI is very good at, at, at going through junk information in the internet and give you answers. But in the same time, current AI system is not able at all to check the validity of their uh, their answer because they have to give you answer anyway. Uh, so even if the next word is very low probability, it still have to give you a next word. And, and that's why it gives you fake information and, and, and uh, so um, museums, I think, validating information that AI can give will always be and will be as the next thing that uh, most of these companies will try to do. And that can only happen if they use trusted source information to validate uh, what AI is giving uh, an answer to. And, and this open um, the dilemma of, of uh, whether the data should be available online or no, because in, in the age of internet, we many institutions made the data available online, but now with AI is creating the internet, many institutions try to hide the information again and or try to maybe sell this information for money. Um, mm -hmm. But that can be ha harmful also because the authority that you have as a museum or as an institution um, um, is, uh, is really gonna be behind walls if you start hiding your data to avoid uh, AI from using it. And that can be harmful for AI itself and uh, uh, the, having uh, reliable AI in the future. So it's a really tricky uh, problem. Yeah, I think I would echo um, some of what Ahmed has said. And uh, to me, it kind of boils down um, to uh, a couple things. One, um, the technology itself is neither good or bad. And what we often see with powerful technologies is it's sort of like a, a mirror to humanity for better or worse, right? So um, it it's gonna drive the good people to do good things with it and the bad people to do bad things with it. And then good and bad is subjective. Um, so I always think of technologies as a mirror to our humanity at any particular moment. Um, I think the other thing that's fundamentally different about this technology is that we've been used to computers working like calculators for a long time, where if you put the right information in, it gives you a correct answer. And it's 100% reliable that the answer is the same and repeatable all the time. This technology is just fundamentally different than that. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's broken necessarily. It's just not the same thing that you're used to using. So I think this will ultimately result in a bit of a paradigm shift in how we think as humans about using technology as tools. Um, but um, I think what was really important and what Ahmed said is that um, and Deborah, your question is about how do you combat um, falsehoods uh, and how do you do that? And I think museums, this is, the, again, back to we have to recognize and step into the power that we have always had and never really fully leveraged. But primary source material 
Um, and the authenticity of that primary source material is an extremely important way to validate media that represents something else. So, you know, um, we've been talking a lot about images and, and how do you use images. In fact, those images are a mediation, a digital production of a real thing. Um, and museums have the real things. And ultimately, that's the end of the the rope as you search for uh, truth is that object um, for many times. So the thing that's missing and the thing that I, I think we will see in the near future is a lot of work by AI companies to build up um, mechanisms for um, authentication. Um, and that might be, so uh, imagine you're Scarlett Johansson, and you're concerned about um, keeping the rights to your own brand through your voice and likeness. Um, how, how should that be done on a technology platform where um, the reuse and the derivative use of images, media, and video is kind of part and parcel of how it works? Um, ultimately, the reason why I think authentication tools are going to happen is because if the big tech companies that are building these products don't figure that out, they won't drive the sales that they ultimately need to drive. So I think it's a very hard problem. Uh, I think bad people are still going to do bad things, but I think there's an incentive towards authenticating the real or at least the unique um, creations of individuals. And that to me is actually very hopeful for the future work of artists. Because right now, visual artists in particular are living at a tenuous time where, um, like Ackman was saying, you, you struggle with thinking about whether to publish your work online or not, um, because it may get co-opted and then used as, you know, derivative sources for AI images. But if you're an artist and that's your livelihood, then then it becomes a very tricky question. But sorry, Deborah, I think that spanned a little bit beyond your particular question, but I hope that was helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. So I think we have one more question from my Keith Angelo. Hi, good morning here from the Philippines. Uh, so I'm Keith uh, from the National Museum of the Philippines. Uh, I would like to well, first, thank uh, ICOMS for organizing this uh, webinar series on AI. And as we all know, we are in the fourth industrial revolution where technology is uh, rapidly advancing towards automation and the so-called uh, Internet of Things. Uh, well, this shift is, of course, beneficial for us in the museum industry. And, of course, we are you know, more open to adopting new technologies and uh, have the funding to do so. So my question to our uh, speakers is, uh, what strategies or programs can uh, can be a starting point or um, a beginning for uh, museums that are trying to uh, use AI for the first time or, you know, have limited budget for it? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start with this one. Um, it's something that I it's a question I often receive from our own staff at the at the National Gallery of Art, too, is with everything that's changing so fast, how do you actually start? Um, and um, there's uh, there's three ways that I am generally telling folks. Um, the the first is to read uh, and read a lot. Um, there are a number of really good weekly or daily email digests of the news in technology and or um, in AI specifically. Um, not a promotion, but two that I enjoy personally. Uh, one is called TLDR, uh, as in the acronym of Too Long Didn't Read. Um, they, have a, they have a newsletter every morning on AI. That one's a little more technical. Um, there's another one that I read every morning. It's called the neuron, like the neuron in your brain. Um, it's a little softer and easier, and there's cats involved, um, which I like. Um, so that you may find interesting. So reading is one. Uh, playing around. 
you just got to get in there and play around, um, use one of the free um, AI tools. Um, there are a number of them out there from companies like OpenAI, um, Microsoft, Google, uh, Anthropic is uh, one that you should definitely look at. Their model is called Claude. Um, so pick your favorite and just start playing around. One thing that's a really visceral experiment that you should try if you're up to it is ask the AI for a recipe that you'd like to cook for dinner and then don't fact check it and make the recipe. Um, you'll uh, experience a little bit of what it feels like to trust in an AI that you know hallucinates and uh, you know, I did this for apple muffins a couple of weeks back and it's, you know, you're not quite sure how those apple muffins are going to turn out. Um, and uh, if it does work, you end up with yummy apple muffins at the end of the um, experiment. Uh, the third one is a little more for institutions is I, I think this is a moment and when we have uh, areas that are full of uncertainty. Um, I've been encouraging our staff to uh, think think big um, and really think about what the best use case of this particular area is um, and pick something hard and start working towards that. Um, but give yourself a little grace that you probably won't make it or at least you won't make it anytime soon. So for us, uh, one of those was we we want to figure out if an AI can describe artworks and do it well, and well to the standard of the National Gallery of Art, which is a very high bar. So this is, we're calling it a moonshot. Um, this is a moonshot. And if you know anything about the history of space travel, when we plan for moonshots, you get lots of spinoffs of other things, technologies and learnings that happen along the way. So even though you might not ever land on the moon, you're gonna find four or five little gems that come out in the process of it. Um, so that's that's generally how I would encourage uh, institutions to explore innovation uh, in general, but um, innovation in this particular area too. You. So now we, we can actually move to the next question from Mohamed de Hekmat. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. First of all, uh, th uh, thank you so much for your inspiring lectures. Uh, my question is about uh, uh, Decolonizing through AI is it uh, par particularly about repatriation and restitution? Is it possible to use these tools and uh, uh, this kind of opportunity to uh, Im improve me museum uh, to be uh, more inclusion, uh, like uh, as I mentioned, rep repatriation or institution? Uh, process that uh, me museum recently uh, have been doing. Ahmed, I was actually going to prompt you on this one because I think some of your work in image matching, and I'm and I'm thinking of uh, kind of the the clip or vector similarity models that you might have experimented with could could hold a decent answer here. Yeah, yeah, uh, Mohammed, I I want to understand more about. Um, can you give an example of a use case uh, or a problem um, like that in in your domain, so I can talk about something specific, not just general. So would. Uh, uh, would you please uh, re repeat your question? I'm just asking. I mean, can you give me an example of um, um, yeah, is or a problem along that line that that uh, help us uh, answer this question in a specific way, not a general way? Yeah. For example, is it possible to uh, do 
uh, some work in a, uh, some museum like uh, the African countries that the original uh, object a hundred years ago transferred to the European countries. And now uh, the museum in the Africa wants to uh, uh, re reorganize an exhibition that the original object uh, objects are not there, you know, like this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so um, um, yeah, there are many problems here. Um, um, AI can be very helpful in 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 uh, some of these aspects, um, in finding uh, things in collections, in matching things in collection, in finding uh, whether uh, some objects, for them, if you're creating creating an exhibition, and and some object in another museum are, that can be useful for you can be found. There are many ways it can be done, things I can, I can be helpful in. I think the problem is more mainly a logistic problem in terms of the data is not there. Um, most museums don't have their collection digitized till now. Um, and if it's digitized, it's not in a searchable uh, a way that can be accessed. Um, usually museum have their databases uh, uh, internal for them and very few uh, of that collection is online. So unfortunately, even with the best AI tool available today or gonna be available in the next 10 years, unless we have more investment in digitizing the collections and make it, it accessible to researchers, we cannot move forward. Um, so the problem is not really the AI problem as more, more as uh, the 20 years old or 30 years old problem of how to digitize the collection and make it available. Thank you. Thank you. I have one other use case for this question to propose. Um, uh, I, up until yesterday, I worked for the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City. We have art uh, for from the Himalayan region. And so we actually, repatriated three objects over the past couple of years to Nepal. And uh, the process for that was, uh, for the first two objects at least, uh, there was extensive research being done by two researchers, one in the US and one in Nepal, comparing archival photos to the object in the Rubin collection and trying to identify whether the object is the same uh, based on details of the, you know, say, for example, facial, like the, 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 the lines of the object and the, the shape, but also where there were damages and uh, holes in it and, and sort of doing side by side comparison. And I understand that some of the photos that were being used for that research were in books, but some of them are online. Uh, so for you know, given that a lot of photos are online, would could there be like could there be an application here for doing these side by side co uh, comparisons and trying to identify whether two two objects are actually the same? Yes, um, I mean there is no tool available, uh, unfortunately, for that. Um, we had developed a tool like that a few years ago, which uh, we still have it. Uh, um, the problem is uh, it's it's a business problem mainly. Uh, um, most of the big companies will not give you a product like that because they don't care about the markets. That's a very small market for them. And um, I personally have a startup company that started doing things like that in the past, but that was not successful as well because when you're dealing with museums, uh, they usually don't have budget for these things or they don't. Uh, they are very slow in in <laughs> in in having things done, and 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 that's not the base of a, how startup work. So you end up basically with a lack of products that are uh, relevant for the museums, although the technology is there. The technology has been there for solving this problem more than 10 years ago. Um, uh, that it's mainly a business problem in terms of how can we uh, uh, build a product um, that can be helpful to answer this question and other questions in a sustainable way uh, as a product. Um, and maybe the time will come where enough museums will, will be on board to, to invest in things like that. Uh, but as I mentioned, I mean, when we did the, um, the example of the Barnes, Barnes was the only museum who adapted this technology. And, and still now, after six, seven years, no other museum is interested in, in, 
in adding technology like that uh, into their their, their uh, uh, websites. So it is a problem. I mean, uh, museums are are a very um, 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 uh, you are museum people, so you know what I mean. Uh, it takes time to adapt technology in museums. It's 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 uh, museum has other priorities uh, and and limited budgets and things like that. And and really that really one of the factors in adapting this, these fast moving technologies in museum that require uh, uh, funding and require uh, basically uh, um, uh, um, uh, teams to be developed. Uh, usually, it's beyond museum museum ability also to develop this internally. And they have to rely on on external uh, uh, companies, but there is no companies that can provide this only for museum. Uh, if there is only one or two museums who are willing to to buy these products, so it's a business problem. Uh, however, I think one thing is changing, um, and uh, recently, it's become quite easy and quite successful to use. AI large language models to assist with software development tasks and. There's a lot of a lot of research being invested in trying to perfect um, that ability and also to develop AI tools that as agents can act on their own to do things like developing software. Um, I th think if you extend that curve out a little bit farther and um, if we look at our um, art history graduate students or digital humanities graduate students, many of them are coming out of their education with skills in at least data analysis um, and quite a bit more tech technology um, as a part of their education. Um, it's entirely likely that um, museums themselves may be able to use AI to assist in writing code that does at least rudimentary comparisons um, like you're talking about. Uh, Ahmed's right, it's not gonna be a, a full-blown tool on the market where we can buy a product and just use it. But uh, I think if we look at where things are going, the, the barrier to building technology products being that I know how to write computer software, that barrier is rapidly going away and is more about systems thinking, architectural principles, and an understanding of data and data handling. Those are things that are being taught um, already, even in the humanities and in art history. So could it could be very interesting over the next few years. We have one more question from Natya. Uh, hello. First of all, thank you very much. Both of the presentations were very, very interesting and inspiring. It's not um, mostly the question, just a comment that I, I wanted to echo with Rob when you mentioned that you've been playing with the AI and uh, you tried to ask them to write the descriptions of the artworks, which is really um, very <laughs> like the moonshot. Um, I uh, it it just came to my mind that yes we should be trying uh, many ways and also do you think that uh, the way we ask those questions also very much uh, define how the answers will be written by AI so when we are talking about integrating AI in our work we also need uh, to learn ourselves how to interact with them. So uh, get as much closer answers and uh, results as possible. Uh, so do you think there could be a program or something in the museums uh, that could also teach the museum professionals how to ask the questions, how to formulate what, what actually we do need from AI to get as a result, and then how to uh, really try and understand how valuable the answer is. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Natia. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, and you're right, um, especially for this uh, generative AI technology that we've been talking about, the the way in which you ask the question um, is extremely important and does impact the way in which the tool generates the answer. Um, specific to the visual description work that we're doing, um, 
this is something that we're um, in collaboration with a number of other large uh, U.S. art museums, uh, including uh, the Metropolitan, the Art Institute, the Getty, um, the Cleveland Museum of Art. And together, um, we're trying to come to a, a standardized way of writing um, what we call the prompt to do this visual description. Um, and there are there are a variety of techniques that we're using to try to increase the the quality of the resulting text that's generated and the reliability of it. Uh, so as we know, uh, AIs hallucinate, or that means they make things up, um, and they make things up unpredictably. Um, so uh, when you're trying to do this and generate high quality results for a few million images, you need to be able to know when they go wrong or when they go rogue. <laughs> and uh, luckily we have human authored texts around the same set of objects um, that we're working to use as almost a gold standard template um, that would tell us when a novel description of an artwork kind of diverges significantly from what human authors would have written about it. Um, and then sends up a flag. Um, at the moment at the National Gallery, we're in a pilot where we're um, trialing these methods on about 500 artworks from our collection and actually sending it through human review for edits and grading. So we're asking human authors to edit the work of an AI. And then we're measuring the edits that they make um, on a semantic level. Um, to figure out how far the AI is off and is it off in predictable ways that we could correct in a prompt. Um, but then also to um, kind of flag us to certain classes of objects that are harder to describe than others. Um, so for instance, uh, we're having very good results on landscape uh, prompts and on abstract um, pictures, uh, photography, we're getting very good results, um, portraiture, believe it or not, is quite difficult because of some of the barriers that the AI models are putting in around privacy concerns and uh, facial recognition. So that is ultimately more of a policy issue than a technology issue, but that's that's sort of where we stand right now. So um, long story short, Natya, uh, to your question, uh, yes. And I actually would like to think that at some point in the future, we would be able to share um, some prompts that museums could use as a starting point to do their own description work uh, or to learn about some of the techniques that are underlying kind of successful approaches. Yeah, I just wanna comment on that, that um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, however, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about um, what's called prompt engineering. Um, spending time or energy in learning about how to prompt, I think it's a useful, uh, a useless waste of time, because uh, whatever you're going to learn from uh, current generation of AI models about how to prompt to them will be useless in the next generation or the next model. Um, uh, so um, that's really fundamentally a, a problem. Um, um, I, I don't recommend really. Uh, investing time in learning how to prompt at all. Uh, it, it's just basically changing all the time uh, with the next model that comes next month. Whatever you, you have learned or whatever experience you have learned about how to prompt is totally becomes useless. So um, I think the answer for this question in general is um, there are fundamental limitations of current AI models in analyzing images. Um, uh, the, 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 the model to analyze images, uh, what, what's called uh, multimedia, uh, multimodal uh, large language models, um, again, are trained on the internet and information found in the internet. So their understanding of art is very, very limited to uh, a small portion of uh, artworks on the internet that has good description. Um, which is not is a really small fraction compared to what's in the internet in terms of uh, images of, of all other genres of uh, on the internet, and uh, that's what uh, um, our experience with uh, AI models um, over the last ten years 
where they are very good at identifying animals and, and things like that. And, and when it comes to art, uh, like in the example of the Barnes Museum, you give it an image of a Renoir uh, artwork and tell you it's a teddy bear or it's a, it's a, it's a whatever stuffed animal. Um, now it's improving definitely because uh, with larger language models, it, has, it can read more information. But again, if you mostly put an artwork in, in any of the chat GBT uh, models, um, the kind of description you're getting is mainly um, a retrieval of what's on the internet to uh, uh, um, um, to similar images to what you give it. So if you give it an image that looks like um, uh, um, a Picasso uh, cubism work, uh, if I haven't seen that, it will just match it to something it have seen and it give you a description that match with what I have seen. Um, so. Now, since again, the real question, which is we are working with Noah since we are working with, with um, subtleties in, 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 in describing artworks here, many of the things that you're gonna want, want, want description for are things that are not in the internet and not in any other museum catalogs and AI will have Um So it's really a problem that um, not, um, I mean, I understand it's, it's useful for museum uh, curators to have AI tool that can write description for them. Um, but with the current technology, it's going to be, I think, long way before this can be done in an accurate way, uh, in a satisfactory way, uh, without hallucination. And I feel that um, this is the core of the museum uh, jobs to really be the, the, the gatekeeper on, on the description you're giving of artworks, because that will be the information that future AI models will learn on. And if this information is not really curated and, and um, uh, checked, we are really setting us up ourselves to bigger problem down the line with AI models that can describe what works based on, on wrong description that are generated by other, other AI. So that's very scary. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. And we are running out of time, so I'm not going to discuss further, but this is so interesting issue and we could learn something, other webinars and um, we, I'm looking forward to other webinars to say uh, rightly. So thank you very much. And um, it was very, very important and interesting to listen to you. Yes, and as we actually come to a close now, I would like to also thank uh, Rob and Ahmed for their thought-provoking presentations. They have been really inspiring and uh, it would be actually very interesting to continue this dialogue into like uh, an AI and museums network working group. Uh, which we are thinking to establish with the ICOM comms. And uh, please follow our next webinars on the 14th of November uh, on practical tools for museum communicators and on the 21st of November on uh, future challenges and ethical considerations for museum communicators. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for your engagement. And I look forward to continue this dialogue uh, and interdisciplinary discussions further. Thank <laughs> you.